Good evening, everybody. This is Darius Asemi with GVR. Welcome to another episode of Unfiltered, uh, coming to you live I'm not from anything, Fresno, really. California. Uh, Mike Krabasi cannot be here tonight, so I'm just going to uh, fly solo, cover two really important uh, topics uh, as it impacts Central California um, and the uh, greater Fresno area. Um, our two guests, uh, number one, Jeff Aiello. He is the CEO of, of Valley uh, PBS. Welcome, Jeff. Hey, Darius. Thanks for having me. Good evening, and, and good to see you. And, if, and uh, Travis Smith, who was with, uh, he's a director of multifamily and commercial development for uh, Citadel Roofing, which they do work uh, statewide. I don't know if they go there nationwide, uh, and Travis will tell us. But Mainly, Tra Travis is going to be talking about what the new rules that are going through uh, state California uh, Public Ut Utilities Commission, what that would do to people that have owned solar or thinking of putting up solar, uh, especially on commercial and uh, if they have an apartment. And then Travis is going to tell us if that impacts single family residential as well. And there's some very interesting, and I want to say upsetting changes that the California Public Utilities Commission, which is the body that makes that ultimate decision, is making to roll out what you can and cannot do with the electricity you produce from your own solar power plant that's on top of your roof. So that'd be the, the second half of the show. Uh, but before we bring Jeff on to talk about Valley PBS, what they're doing, um, the the program that they had uh, on water tap, tapped out, uh, the documentary series. I want Jeff to talk about that. Uh, where, do, where does he see, where does Valley PBS uh, see drought, opportunities, storage, uh, all of that in California? And, um, and, then, and then we'll get to uh, Mr. Smith. But before we start, a uh, couple of quick things. Let's put up slide three, the poll that uh, we did on should there be a mandatory retirement age for U.S. House and Senate members? So, over, well, not overwhelming majority, a bare majority, not a majority, uh, I, I guess that's just a plurality, plurality of you said yes, 65 should be the max age uh, for members of the House and Senate. And we got quite a few over that. Paul, oh, we should probably dig in uh, later this week. What, how many, what percentage of members of the House and Senate are over 65? Mr. Paul, okay. All right. Uh, Senate GOP leader Mitch McConnell had another um, episode I think last week. I'm going to figure that part out. And then we're going to move to President Biden's a historic uh, proposal to make marijuana a class three drug. So now you can do all kinds of testing. I guess it could become um, like a specialty Tylenol that you can get, not over the counter, but you can buy it at a store. And mm -hmm. making it a class three, you can get a lot more testing and, of course, a lot more availability. So uh, GBWire covered that. Uh, go to GBWire.com, take a look at uh, that article, a lot of, a lot of great, uh, great information. And then the university that is doing some, some work. Uh, actually, that's, um, that is on, which slide is that on? Okay. Let's go to that slide on. There's a, I, I believe it's Minnesota. There you go. That's uh, um, 
doing, uh, allowing uh, all kinds of curriculum on marijuana and marijuana business and testing and laboratories, et cetera. Okay, um, oh, one more on, and this one, this time is on psychedelics. Psychedelic therapies could help heal California's ailing, age, ailing first responders. Um, how it impacts the, the brain, some of these psychedelics, and impacts, helps remove uh, depression. Uh, pretty interesting article. Take a look at that. So with that, as we're talking about cannabis and mushrooms and things uh, farming, let's uh, bring Mr. Aiello in. Uh, Jeff, you don't need any introduction as uh, the CEO of Valley PBS, but kind of tell us a little bit about what PBS does for those of us in the Valley that are not up to speed or don't watch it every night. Tell us who the primary audience is, what does PBS do, and what is your role, and then we'll roll right into Tap Tap. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Darius. Good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, you know, Valley PBS is is really, um, it's, it's, it's not just Fresno, it's, it's uh, the, the Central and South Valley's public television station. And so we serve Bakersfield uh, up to Fresno, up to Merced. So it's, it, it's a lot bigger footprint than just the regular uh, broadcast affiliates have here in the Fresno area, which typically only go down to about Porterville. Um, we, we are obviously, we've all remember growing up with Sesame Street and Electric Company, and so we still provide uh, an incredible amount of children's programming every day uh, to, our, to our children uh, that, are, you know, that are not in school yet and programming that's there for them at when they're, when they're uh, out of school. Um, PBS is also home to some great uh, entertainment programming in prime time. You also you obviously have your your PBS News Hour, your BBC News that that airs in the evenings, and um, and then some great marquee you know network shows like Finding Your Roots, uh, Antiques Road Show. It, typically, as we get later in the day, the audience for Valley PBS ages up a little bit. One of my um, uh, goals as CEO uh, is to sort of age the station down a little bit um, with programming that appeals to a younger audience as well. So we've been working hard on that. Obviously, uh, we're here in the Central Valley and agriculture is a big part of that. And um, what brought me to, to Valley PBS was after working for the Walt Disney Company for many years, about 14 years, I, re I ran the production and marketing departments at ABC 30 in town for a long time. Um, I started, I left the company and started my own production company and then started doing a travel show called Outside Beyond the Lens uh, for Valley PBS. That show kind of took off. Um, we're proud to, uh, we're proud of the fact that uh, Outside Beyond the Lens uh, on Valley PBS uh, is the only nationally airing uh, television show, broadcast national uh, television show out of the Fresno market, which is great. So that uh, Outside Beyond the Lens airs in almost 300 PBS markets nationally and in about 10 countries internationally. When it comes to ag, I've always been someone as a kid who grew up respecting and admiring farmers. I, I've always looked up to farmers. And so when I came back to the Central Valley in, in the late 90s after my world tour and working all over the country, um, and started getting reattached to agriculture. Um, Valley PBS came to me in 2017 and commissioned me to direct a, a documentary that they had started called Tapped Out. And um, I, when I jumped in with that, that's when I started to really learn the headwinds that agriculture and, and specifically fam family farmers are up against um, when it comes to regulation, water issues, um, environmental overreach, in my opinion, and and started to see how it's not a really e it's not a really easy place to grow stuff when it happens to be one of the best places on earth to grow stuff. And so, uh, tapped tapped out became sort of an advocacy documentary uh, to kind of show people to dive in ex and explain California water, which is really complicated, and you know it's it's vast and it's it's complex. And I love the challenge of explaining complex systems to kind of like an eighth grade level. I think if you can hit an eighth grade level uh, on basic uh, your basic television audience, most everybody will follow <clears> along <throat> and not get lost. So tapped out one, we did it. It got a lot of re feedback, a lot of response. Some good, some bad. Some of my friends on the on the left didn't like didn't like uh, some of the uh, what I call truth that we shared about um, uh, agriculture and 
what it does and how much water it actually uses. And then that led to Tapped Out 2, which we just uh, we just aired uh, last September. And we're working on Tapped Out 3 now. These are This is a documentary series. So it's uh, not a weekly series, but it's about every year, every other year, we, we plan on continuing the Tapped Out franchise. What, do, you, do we have a clip of that to show, Chad? I didn't send a clip to Paul. No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, Tapped Out 2, Tapped Out 2 can be watched at the Valley PBS uh, uh, YouTube channel at valleypbs.org on our app if you have it. It's on demand on all of our digital platforms. And I can, recommend uh, Chad, can we uh, track it down now on YouTube and show, or is that too yeah, complicated? Exactly. Okay, yeah. so we'll, we'll, we'll show the bad parts of Tap Tap too. So, since you're not, you didn't go through and hand pick a nice 60-second uh, slip for us. Um, yeah, no, you use whatever you want. We're proud of all of it. And Jeff, I think you can tap, tap out. Yeah, go ahead. You I'm told sorry, us a little bit about that. Tell us uh, why. Don't you talk about how much water each tree uses and each almond uses? And can you tell us what the gist of it, this is, the consumption? And then well, what are the well, recommendations it, it, that it, your it, documentaries it, end up actually making for the audience? Can you give us a give place the audience? So, I'm watching this show right now. Why should I go to Valley PBS or YouTube and, and spend an hour watching that show? Well, the easy answer is why you should watch it is because as a human being, you, you typically in this country like to eat three times a day. And so, um, you know, food is sort of the one common denominator that binds us all together. It doesn't matter what your political persuasion is. We all got to eat. And um, and I think there's a lot of folks that take for granted or don't understand where food actually comes from. Um, and so that was sort of the the inception point for the tapped out series was to explain the one resource that we all need more than anything, or as important as oxygen and food would be water. And you got to have water to grow uh, food. And we grow a heck of a lot of food here in uh, the Central Valley of California. So we kind of broke it down into different issues. Okay. So tapped out two was released just before this incredible winter that we had, where we have the surplus and abundance of water and uh, and so tapped out three that we're going to make in the winter, this winter is going to really address and go back and look at what did that, what did this winter that we just had show in our deficiencies of capacity to store water and what we do with the water we can't store. And so that's kind of where that's going. Tapped out two really gets into the politics of water and um, the battle between environmental protections and the ability to make water available to farms and to cities for use. And that's sort of the generic uh, setup of the film. We get into, now one of the things I'm, I'm really big on is, you know, like, like I grew up, my dad always said, there's three sides to every story. There's, there's your side, my side, and the truth. And on this documentary series, because it's so supercharged with uh, politics, water, um, it was important for me to, you know, have both sides of the environmental side of it and of uh, a more, which would, which would be typically a left-leaning side and a more right-leaning leaning side to what, um, uh, you know, the growth of ag and the protection of ag is. And so there, you'll hear voices in the film that do that. Um, and so we really kind of break down and get into different stories that all tell, that are all themed in a thread. And, and I really like that kind of storytelling. I, I, instead of just going through and explaining with VO, voiceover, you hear there's no narrator in this film. There's I, You don't hear me. You don't see me. You don't hear a narration that's been read by somebody that wrote something. It's just people talking. It's farmers. It's environmentalists. It's water managers. It's people that are everyday folks. And and it's it's a I think it's a compelling um, you know, composite of where we are right now in California water and why it should matter to you as an everyday citizen. And that's the biggest hurdle because most people, especially in our large uh, metropolitan centers in California that vote a particular way, um, as long as you hit the faucet and the water comes out, no worries. As long as you go into the store and a cantaloupe doesn't cost 10 bucks, no problem. But when those things start to change, I wanted the viewers to know the why behind those things that are coming. And, and that's what Tapped Out was designed to do.
Great, great point. Unfortunately, so many of the, so much of the time, we need a catastrophe to happen before we make change. In other words, oh, we want, we want like, just like you said, uh, we, we want a pound of almonds to be, you know, 20 bucks and a glass of wine, or a bottle of cheap wine at the store to start at 30 bucks uh, before we go, oh my gosh, what's happening to our water? Why are we shipping so much of it to the ocean? Uh, what is the best use of our water? Why do we not have more above and below ground, especially below ground storage? So when we have years like this year, we can take advantage of the, plent the, the plenties that our God has given, uh, blessed us with uh, in, in Central California. But Yeah, uh, well, you know, to, to that point, and I think when you get into what's coming up in what Tapped Out 3, and in some of the... Uh, we're going to have two episodes in the, we have an agricultural series that has become very popular. It airs on all the PBS stations in California called American Grown, My Job Depends on Ag. And we are going to hit this water storage issue and the Tulare Lake issue uh, and our abundance that we had this winter in that series as well. I mean, just, just as an example, Darius, when you take a look at the, the shortages, the shortfalls of our our ability to store water in the state of California, <clears throat> Our water year starts October 1st. That's right around the corner, right? And a lot of our reservoirs are at capacity or they're starting to let off right now. And you take like, like take Don Pedro Reservoir, for instance. Um, it's top of conversation red line. It's top of conversation red line goes into effect October 9th. And it's at 801 feet of lake level. So they've got, all, we have all this water. We've, 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 the crops are done. We, we, we're, we're just letting this water go now. The, the, bio, the, the ecosystem of the Delta is important, right? We need that fresh water to flush the Delta. But my biggest issue with, with environmentalism as it, as it, as it, as it uh, pertains to agriculture is when, does, when do environmental policies, when are they put to the same stringent look that agriculture is put at for its water use. You know, the, the, you know ag the environment gets half of California's developed water right off the bat, yet it never has to really answer for it. And, and on that same point, it's not shown any results. You know, the fish species that are, that are supposedly being protected by this extra water are not coming back. The Delta smelt and the winter run Chinook salmon, their, their numbers are continue to suffer. So it's obviously not throwing more water at them is the issue. What is the issue? Let's get into that. Those are some of the things we'll be looking at in Tapped Out 3. Okay. I don't know, if uh, Paul, if we have this uh, slide or not. If we don't have it, we should probably put it on the website tomorrow. Uh, GB Wire did a series of stories on water going back, gosh, seven, eight years ago. Uh, California gets, what is it, roughly 200 million acre feet of water on average every year. Roughly half of that is available for development and, and human consumption on this side of the Sierras. My memory serves me correctly. And out of that 100 million acre feet, 50% is for environmental reasons or wetlands and uh, keeping rivers uh, flowing and, and wet. 40% uh, is for food production or ag and about 10% for municipal use. So the 10% for municipal use but Governor Brown first said, okay, you know what? We got to cut, take less showers. Don't wash your car outside. So the 10 million acre feet, we, uh, the goal was to cut it down to seven and a half million acre feet. But we didn't touch the environmental part, which is 50 million acre feet. So what happens, so much of the urban areas in California, we replaced grass and shrubs and some trees with just desert scape. And if you go to our downtowns, temperature in, down, in any downtown where there's very few trees or, or shrubs uh, is warmer uh, with less carbon sequest sequestering trees than in suburb, the suburbia. So we yeah. saved water on the municipal use, but we didn't touch the enviro uh, part. Uh, no, no, and that's a great point, and it leads into one of the one of my you know big initiatives this year with American Grown. My job depends on ag, and will be untapped out. In fact, the very first episode of season four of American Grown will air on uh, September twentieth at seven thirty p.m. And this is where this is kind of the coming out party that I want people to sort of understand. Agriculture never 
gets credit for the incredible amount of carbon it, sequ it sequesters into the ground every year. In the U.S. alone, U.S. agriculture sequesters about 650 million metric tons of carbon through the process of photosynthesis and growing food. Yet agriculture gets beat up a lot by the environmental left as being a destroyer of the planet. And it only talked about is the, is the, uh, is, is the CO2 levels or nit nitrous oxide levels or nitrogen levels that or methane levels that it puts into the atmosphere. Every industry on earth puts out a carbon footprint, including agriculture. But agriculture, as far as US industries, is sequesters the most and it never gets talked about. And so, you know, when you see a farmer, thank that farmer for being on the front lines of fighting climate change. Because climate change is real, it's here. We can have a debate about how much is human caused and whether or not um, having everybody drive an electric vehicle um, is going and putting solar up everywhere is going to save that. The problem with EVs and solar is they don't suck carbon atoms out of the atmosphere. Only photosynthesis does that. Only plants and trees do that. And you can go around the country and there's like nine places around the country where they have these these, in my opinion, ridiculous machines that they've built to filter the air of the world. Um, they've got them in Switzerland and, and they're, they're, they're taking like 9,000 metric tons out a year per plant. You know, think about what ag's doing just here. And so I want people to understand that when you vote a certain way and you make it tough for a family farmer um, or industrial giant <clears throat> agricultural operations, we need to be thinking about everything we can do to keep those large ag operations and the medium and family fi family farm operations going because not only are they growing food they're literally cleaning the atmosphere every day they're in business one of my uh acquaintances from the bay area told me this is years ago maybe 10 years ago he said listen we don't need to farm in california it's only 50 billion dollar industry compared to at the time state gdp of two trillion just, let's just ship it to Mexico or El Salvador or Colombia, you know, and just import the stuff from there. I said, well, you care about the environment, you know, CO2 or C CO production and transport? He said, listen, I just don't want any, I want less people in California, bottom line. I don't want people coming to the valley, you know, most of them are immigrants anyhow, come over illegally, they farm here illegally, they're working on farms, and I don't want them around. So anyhow, I, we kind of, we kind of. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I get that. And that it sets up another one of the giant hypocrisies of the environmental left, in my opinion, which is you care about the environment, but you're okay tr transporting your perceived damage to the environment, parenthetically, which there is none by agriculture because it nets it out by what it sucks out <clears throat> by growing the stuff. But you're okay. You don't want to see it here in California where we have beautiful class one soils, a Mediterranean climate. We are technically a desert in the valley, but we have this incredible maritime snowpack that washes through this desert every year, even in a bad year. We get tons of water. We can grow food here remarkably. If you, if you took a compass and stuck it in Fresno and drew a 100-mile circle around Fresno, um, you would see that we grow 50% of all the produce that's consumed in the United States grows in that circle. Think about that. Less than 1% of the land mass of the United States grows 50% of all the produce, 75% of all the almonds that the world consumes, 14% more peaches than the peach state of Georgia. I could go on, but the hypocrisy of, and then, and then Darius real quick, you use that 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 point that a lot of folks bring up. Well, it doesn't make it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't add up in the GDP of California. That's usually when you're just talking about the net proceeds of what a farmer or a shipper, packer, grower gets when they sell their product. The, the reason we call this show "My Job Depends on Ag." Agriculture touches every one of us in ways beyond just buying an apple at the store or an orange. I'm wearing agriculture right now in the form of linen and cotton that was grown in, in a field somewhere. You know, the alcoholic beverages we consume are, are part of agriculture. Our homes are built with agriculture. So if you really want to get in and start netting out 
all the financial impacts of agriculture beyond just the sell point, it's going to be a lot bigger than a 2% GDP. Yeah, I said, hey, I told him, you want less people? Look at the areas that have the most amount of congestion, let's face it, is San Jose and Los Angeles. Let's take all the tech industry, all of you guys, let's ship you guys to El Salvador. You know, you can have all your design studios for uh, the tech in San Jose. It, it, it removes, uh, I guarantee you, it's going to remove a ton of congestion if we deport. No, I'm kidding. Uh, if, if we ask you guys to leave uh, out of California, so the rest of us don't have to deal with all your crap and traffic in the Bay Area, and especially, especially Los Angeles. But I, I, well, I'm there, gonna... there's a reason people come here, and it's a great place to be. Yeah. But we, but we have to have a, we have to have a governing. You know, we have to have government, state government, that understands that there has to be balance. If you're, if we're going to invite people in, and I, you know, I'm a big fan of our farm workers. I do a show every year on American Grown, championing our farm workers. Uh, we can't get the crops out of the fields without them, right? Um, but 100%. if you're not going to build the infrastructure to to properly take care of this growing population in the form of surface water storage systems, dams. Um, and off-site storage reservoir systems like sites up in Sacramento, um, then you are kind of on a recipe for disaster and overpopulation is definitely an issue here. Uh, Chad, how are we doing on video? Cool. We're gonna, so we, we've, we've been playing some of your video on Tapped Out, and then now we're going to put some of our video that we shot a few weeks ago off the, off the Friant Dam, the abundance cool. of water overflowing. Let's, kinda, let's place that real quick. Yeah, does this have talking on it? Because I can talk over this if you want me to. <laughs> talk over it. This is from. A yeah, few, I mean, a lot of people don't realize Bryant Dam. I went out and shot a bunch of drone footage of this as, as well. This is great looking stuff you guys got. A lot of people don't realize, and this is a classic example as you watch that water gush over the top of Bryant Dam. Bryant Dam was built in the 40s and is grossly undersized for the watershed above it. Meaning that the San Joaquin River on a good year, on an average year, that lake, that dam has to be exercised five times. Meaning the entire volume of Millerton Lake has to be emptied into the San Joaquin River. A lot of that going out to the ocean. Um, five times a year in a normal year to maintain the primary function of a dam, which is to prevent flooding, right? and. So so this is a situation where you can go to the Temperance Flat Dam that was proposed a few years ago and didn't get all the funding it was supposed to get by the state by the state water commission. And this is building a, a, a much larger dam about halfway back in Millerton Lake uh, on a river that already has five dams. So it's not like you're wrecking this this you know virgin ecosystem that doesn't have already you know hydroelectric and dams on it. Um, and yet you create this bounty of storage that. Uh, allows us to hold more of this water back for those droughts that we know are coming. It's part of the California weather cycle. We have a couple of bonus years of it, water, it, and we have we a couple of dry years. Most of the stuff that most of the infrastructure built in California was done decades ago. But exactly. I don't know, fifty. We haven't 40s. built a major dam in forty years. Uh, and now we're actually this. Aren't we? Is it a, a, a climat? Uh, gosh, is it Oregon or California? Uh, the the dam that's coming down. Uh, can you put it it's up? On the, it's on the Klamath River. It's Klamath. Uh, yeah, it's on, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, so, yeah, let's see if we can find that and, uh, and put that up. But we're just taking stuff down, and yeah, instead now, of really building stuff, I mean, building Fryant Dam would not happen today. We agree. There's no, no way it, we could build it. It won't. It won't. And and on that dam story in Northern California that you're talking to, I'm very familiar with that because we did an episode uh, two seasons ago on American Grown specifically um, with the two Native American tribes up there that have fought for that dam to be brought down and the farmers in, in the um, in the in the uh, Tule Lake you know area up there. And those dams, they aren't actually agricultural benefiting dams. And that, so that's that's a little misleading. That headline was a little misleading because the water that's stored behind those dams is really for hydro and Warren Buffett owns those three dams right. uh, on, on the Klamath. And it's really not about agriculture. It, I mean, the upper Klamath does have water that goes into the Tule Lake drainage for agriculture. And that's a great agricultural area. But you're also talking about restoring salmon populations to native tribes up there like the Karuk 
um, that their their whole existence and heritage is important and okay. and and tied to that salmon. So I this is where I kind of get to the middle on this a little bit more. It, these stories, um, there, I think there needs to be balance with everything you're talking. We're going to move on to PG&E, but before, but, but please stay with us because this next segment is going to be very fascinating once you find out what's uh, happening uh, yeah, in absolutely. our state CPUC. But question for you. So every time, you know, f farmers, you know, advertise, market, I got folks on the left telling me, again, you guys, um, because we're farm too, for disclosure purposes, we're home builders, real estate developers, and in the media business, and education, and also in farming. Um, that, hey, you guys, you know, rape the ground, destroy it. Uh, you fund these programs through PBS and uh, your own uh, media outlet to get one side of the story. We don't need any more farming. Export it to Central, uh, Central, Central America. Uh, less people, less population. I said, by the way, the folks that are here working, yes, some are maybe undocumented, but there are some of the hardest working folks. I'm not going to get into the immigration debate tonight. Uh, uh, the legal immigration debate, by the way, let me say that, that our country lacks as, as a tool to help uh, relieve some of our uh, choke points here in our country and, and allow some of the brain, uh, brainy folks and the labor folks that we need, uh, shortages that we have to, to, to come to our country. But uh, the, the debate, you know, I mean, I've heard this so many times. You guys fund these programs. You guys, uh, you, know, you know, don't cover why we should let California go back to where it was 50 years ago. A uh, lot less congestion, a lot less traffic, a uh, lot less crime. I said, well, if you want to go back 50 years ago, that, uh, I'm pretty sure we were a red state at the time. Uh, yeah. But any comments on that, Jeff, before well, we move uh, on? Yeah, I, yeah, so I'll say it this way. There, are, there is, in my opinion, no better environmentalist on planet Earth than a farmer. That farmer has to take care of that land, which they do, so that it continues to produce its products and grow its plants, its uh, its food that it, that they're growing with with by knowing how to take care of the ground. Agriculture in the last fifty years, really last thirty years, has made vast improvements in technology in its understanding of water resources, and is thirty percent more efficient than it was thirty years ago, and grows thirty percent more food. And so, you know, the folks that are out there, and I'll just end with this, that want to export the growing of food overseas, do you really, you really want to take a longer view at that, I think, because all you have to do is go back to the 80s and look what happened to Russia when they ran out of wheat and didn't know how to grow it themselves and got themselves in a political bind where they had to give up nuclear weapons to learn how to get, learn how to grow wheat and get wheat shipments from us. We, it's a national security issue at the end of the day, and that's not hyperbole, that's not right-wing scare tactics. Every population on earth needs to grow its own food supply, in my opinion. I agree. And we're really good at doing it here. That's a great point. I mean, we're, we're spending uh, billions of dollars, I don't know what that exact number is, 100 billion, 200 billion, to bring uh, microchip manufacturing back into the United States for national security reasons. And then some of these folks want us to export our food manufacturing. So we're going to be at the mercy of some of these other countries in uh, about Central America or wherever it may be. And we import a lot of our food. I mean, like from Chile, South America, probably Central America, Mexico. I know we, we, you know, we do a lot of work with, with Mexico. A uh, couple of comments on that, by the way, Larissa Jackson Exporting food is going to make it more expensive to buy. Correct. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the exporting it. Food the, the production. Same, the same, that's people, what I, that yeah. the same yeah. people that complain about us growing food here um, complain more when, you know, their food prices go up. Now, there's a yeah. reason why food, food is inexpensive here. The, at the, other, the flip side of that coin, though, Darius, is that I think buyers, consumers here in America, we need to start taking care of our American farmers better. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I, I think, you know, you know, when when those grapes come in from Chile and you get them at, you know, two bucks for a bushel of them, um, you know, 
I think it'd be okay to pay a little bit more if we were taking care of the the valley farmer here that was growing that same product. You know, or we could, or we could uh, don't pay as much. Make sure their water is affordable by having good water water supply instead of shipping it to the ocean. I mean, water yeah. can cost from fifty dollars an acre foot all the way to two thousand dollars an acre foot, depending yeah. on if you have a drought, what part of Central California you went you're in. And at two thousand dollars an acre foot, farmers can't make any money; they're losing money. So I mean, well, take, no, that's, take, that's the problem. I mean, you know yeah. this better than me. Uh, you know, all, it costs about two dollars and fifteen cents a pound. Uh, to grow, uh, to break even on almonds, it costs about two fifteen. Yeah, and and if you're not there, you're losing money, and that's why we're seeing almonds getting pushed over and whatnot. So the cost of water is a huge issue. We explore that and tapped out. Well, really looking forward to uh, watching that show. Before, first of all, please stay with us. There's a bunch of questions that just came in. I want to. Add, Inga has a question. Do you present any of these water issues in schools? like junior high and high school. So from a folks get yes. educated. Yes, okay. we do. Ch uh, American grown. My job depends on ag is regularly played uh, through uh, <clears throat> Valley schools. Uh, I know because the teachers write me and show me the, they show me the videos and they, yep. they play it in the school. So they're showing it there to the kids. Cam Malloy says it would be nice if we were just a balanced state instead of all red or blue. And if we could work together for the greater good. Yes, uh, amen. you're here to that. I, I think there's lots of great ideas on the left, and I think there's lots of great ideas on the right. Obviously, the beauty happens when we all work in the middle a little bit more politically. Um, California, in my opinion, is grossly out of balance with the way it's governed right now because we don't have any of those ideas from the right infiltrating into policy. Well, no, I mean, what is it? We're two thirds, seven eighths, nine tenths uh, Democrat in Sacramento. Right, so it's really, it's not a Republican versus Democrat debate in Sacramento. It's moderate Democrats versus li liberal or, or left-wing de Democrats that are having a debate. If you're a Republican in Sacramento, you're just kind of getting a check for 130, 40 grand, not doing a whole lot, not needed as much. And until, by the way, the state Republican Party changes some of its I issues uh, or... There's a, no a catastrophe in California where people go, I'm sick and tired of homeless issue, defecation in my sidewalk in front of my store, getting mm -hmm. robbed. People walking into my store, grabbing stuff at daylight and just walking out and, and, and getting, having uh, my home broken into and the guy going out, you know, being letting out free the next day. Until we as Californians get sick and tired of that crap, this thing is going to continue to go. You know it is I mean? true. And that, that scenario you just painted, it's like a glacier. It moves slow, yeah. um, but, it, but it moves. And we will get to that point. You know, our democracy was founded a long time ago in a, in a beautiful way. It's supposed to oscillate. It goes to the left. It goes to the right. When it gets too far one way, the center always pulls it back. Exactly. And so those oscillations are extreme and large right now. So they're going to take a longer time to center the bubble. Hey, I'm co I come from a part of the world, Iran. Where, you know, the pendulum swing in, in our country is this much. Over there, you know, gosh, it just upended the whole system back in the late 70s. A couple other quick comments and we've got to move to our, yep. our next topic. And Travis is sitting there patiently waiting. Hold on. Real-time Farid, God forbid we encounter another pandemic. Not having homegrown foods would be a catastrophe. Uh, Inga, Absolutely. With, another com with another comment. The activist environmentalists need to clean up some manure <laughs> on a farm or dairy and do a farmer's job 24-7. That's a pretty interesting comment. Um, yeah, that, that shows a lot right there, though. I mean, yeah. and, and those comments are basically founded on just the, the, the environmental left's really good job of misleading what's really happening. I, I mean, there, I mean, the dairy farms in California now are doing remarkable things uh, to clean up, not only clean up what they do, but actually help in climate in fighting climate change. Okay, so lots of lots of other comments. Great job, and yeah, um, Darius, can I go back later and answer these? Will these be on Facebook? I don't know how. These are all on Facebook. You can yeah. actually go back and respond to all of them on Facebook okay. uh, tonight, tomorrow, whenever you want. Yes, absolutely. But don't okay. go awake because this this next topic is going to get people amped up, maybe as much, if not more. Let's bring in our next guest uh, from Citadel. Travis Smith, 
uh, stay on. I'm a fact, uh, Jeff, you can stay on at the same time. Listen sure. in. At, at, uh, Travis, tell us what our beautiful California Public Utilities Commission was trying to accomplish last week uh, and what that means for somebody that just invested, whether it's an apartment owner or a commercial owner uh, or, or maybe a residential homeowner that just put in a $20,000 solar power producing plant on top of the roof. Tell us what's, what's going on. Hey, it's good to see you again. Thanks good for having me. And uh, Jeff, I need to look into uh, uh, brush up on some of my water policy in California. That's very interesting. And, and I'll be sure to check out your uh, tapped out series. Thank you. Uh, all the best with that. It's very important you. work you're doing. Thank you. So Darius, yeah, good to see you again. And um, it's been an exciting uh, 12 to 24 months with solar in California specifically. Um, with the CPUC changing laws, uh, changing regulation um, that, that really affects consumers of solar. And that being homeowners uh, like yourself, myself, uh, that being investors, developers, builders, uh, commercial developers. Um, so a lot's been changing. I don't think I've ever seen, sometimes we call it the solar coaster. Um, and I don't think I've ever seen a more, we'll call it exciting 24 months or past two years. There's there's just been so much changing. Um, so in uh, April, um, the California Public Utilities Commission uh, signed into law and passed, they proposed a change to the net metering of solar in California. And net metering, for anybody that doesn't know, is the mechanism uh, at which you produce solar on your house and you get credits for the solar that you don't use immediately, and they give you credit via net metering. And that, that um, <clears throat> program has changed over the years, and we've gone through net metering one, two, and, and now we're at three. Um, and so they broke it into two parts. Uh, there's net metering for homeowners and, and traditional standard net energy metering. And then there's what's called virtual net metering. And virtual net metering affects and is a program that you sign up for when you have multi-tenant properties, such as apartment complexes, multifamily housing, condo complexes, or commercial properties that have multiple tenants uh, within it. And what you do with virtual net metering is you put one large solar system on the roof, you physically connect it at one location, and then all of the energy is distributed to the tenants virtually uh, on the back end in a billing structure. So there's two net metering. There's one tie-in, one customer, that's net energy metering, and then there's virtual net metering. And they're two separate topics, and I could you know, kind of go on forever uh, about this, but um, there's there's been changes to both this year. In April, uh, the California Public Utility Commission that governs the investor-owned utilities in California, I should make that clear. Um, so they oversee San Diego Gas and Electric, Southern Cal Edison, and Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, any other utility in the state is a municipal utility and not subject to that same, same regulation. Uh, so this this is for investor-owned utilities, which is the the majority of our state. By the way, uh, Travis, we have an image on the screen of the members of the California Public Utilities Commission and their contact info, their email addresses. Okay, that's wonderful. Yeah, at the and, you know, and I encourage everybody to go to the website and you know write an email to the um, the governing board and the California Public Utility Commission and and challenge them, ask them to overrule. Uh, some of the things I'm going to go to in here later that are just killing solar in California. Um, so as a, as a homeowner and, and for a single family home, you know, I have a system that uh, it's called net energy metering. And in April, uh, so I used to be able to sell any solar energy that I produced on my roof back to the utility and get a one for one credit. So if I sold one kilowatt hour back to the utility, they'd give me one kilowatt hours worth of credit. So that was net energy metering two. In April, that ceased, April 15th, that stopped. So anybody now going solar, uh, you sell energy back to the utility at a much less rate, a wholesale. They, give, they don't give you a one-for-one -one credit anymore. They give you maybe a, 
you know, a, a 0.2 or a 0.3, 7 cents a kilowatt hour versus Tra 40 cents. Travis, let me, let me come in real quick. This is a really important point for the audience uh, to, to understand. If you're putting a solar system on your home or on your building after April 15th of this year, the electricity that you produce, you're going to sell to PG&E or to your, your, to your utility at one rate, and then you're going to buy that same electricity at night because you're producing during the day. You're going to buy that same electricity at night at four and five and eight times more per kilowatt hour. You, produce, you sell it roughly five cents a kilowatt hour. You buy it back at 25 to 45 cents a kilowatt hour. Is that correct, Travis? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And what you can do is now, I mean, there's a couple, you know, creative options you can do. You can add a battery. So you're not selling, you're not giving any of the solar back to the grid. You store it all on but site. How much is a battery? Hold on. How much does a battery cost? Batteries can be anywhere from $6,000 to $18,000, uh, depending on what kind you go, how big you go, uh, how many you want. Can a battery, if I have a $10,000 battery, can I store enough energy to be off the grid? Actually, be off the grid permanently. Just produce during the day and use at night at least six months out of the year in the Fresno area. So you can absolutely size a battery, solar and battery system to be self-supporting. So you don't okay. need to import or export anything from the grid. Um, I will say that a, a single battery for most homes in California is probably not going to be sufficient. Um, but what companies like Citadel Roofing and Solar do is we can sit down and go over it energy consumption and we can size a system and put together a nice pro forma or like a proposal to show you exactly how much solar, how many batteries you need to, to get to that goal, if that's your goal. Okay. Absolutely. Now, the nice thing with, with buying solar for your home is, is that you can still use, so during the day, if you work from home or you have, if you're using appliances at home during the day, any solar that you use uh, while the sun is shining and while your solar is producing, you can use that without exporting it to the grid. And you only export what you don't use. Now, what's recently changed for virtual net metering, virtual net metering for, again, for renters, this is a direct assault on renters and multi-tenant properties in California, um, is, is that, so if you put solar for virtual net metering up, you can't use anything on site as as the decision is proposed today with the CPUC. Um, you have to sell 100% of the solar electricity you produce back to the to the utility company at a very low reduced markdown rate, wholesale rate, and then buy 100% of your electricity usage back at that five, ten, five, eight times markup. But this is, isn't this what we call rigging the system to benefit the utilities? And CPUC is going to rule on that. Let's put CPUC image back up. Uh, CPUC's uh, commissioners, five of three, I'm assuming three out of these five uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen are going to, well, one gentleman and, and uh, four ladies are going to vote on this issue, on which direction it, sh it should go. Uh, whether you know we produce basically we're going to invest in solar produce electricity for the utility uh, and give it to them almost for free and then buy it back at a substantially higher rate this is called yeah. what i call a rigged system Buy. let's see if cpuc votes on that it's a very nice way to put it there is it's rigged. Yep. <laughs> i have some other choice words that i would like to use but i'll refrain well, um, I, mean, I hope I hope that they they make the right choice in the end. And and there's one thing that we're trying to to persuade them and reason with them to to make a change with, and that's what's called on-site netting. The term is called on-site netting. So if anybody wants to take action, and you're going to email Governor Newsom or the CPUC or anybody, quick email, maybe take five minutes of your day to to really help the outcome of solar. Um, what you would want to be uh, probably focusing on is what's called on-site netting. And that allows you to use whatever energy you produce on site first and only export at low rates what you don't consume on site. So I mean, basically, so, Governor Newsom and his appointees to CPUC, if they pass this, they want us to buy a, a power plant 
produce electricity and donate it to pg and &E and, and utilities. Is that true? That so basically what's worse than that, Darius, is you being a home builder, the state is mandating <clears throat> and forcing you to put solar on your projects. So they're 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 mandating that you buy this solar package and buy this solar good, sell it back to them at wholesale, and then buy it back from them at retail. Yep. That, that's that's how we, we make California middle class poor. You're gonna you're gonna spend this much money, you're gonna produce electricity, you're gonna sell it at this price, then you're gonna go back and buy the same unit at five times more. How do you make Californians poor? By actions of C I'm gonna say it. This really pisses me off. Uh, it, let's see where tragic. CPU. If this, passes, if this passes, it will be tragic and it will kill virtual net metering. Well, I mean, why would you more? Yes, California is forcing all new development to go solar. I get that. Uh, but if you're an older home, why would you want to ever go put a solar plant on only to give the electricity? It's almost like it reminds me of the Middle East dictatorships. We're going to force you to do this. You're going to go produce it. And you're going to deliver it at this price to us. And the same unit, you're going to buy back at five times more. And God, it's really yes. irritating. Now, you know, to, to side with, not side with the utility, but to, to shed a little light on where they're coming from, I think you do have the choice to not enter into a net metering agreement. So you could put solar up and you don't have to enter as a contract. And I, and I believe that that's kind of a position that some people are taking is you don't have to enter the contract. You can put batteries up and not participate in net metering. That is an option, but that adds so much cost to the project that becomes on that. So uh, actually, uh, this guy put up some, Jerkovic put up something that says, five times more stick to the facts. Yes, that's actually 10 times more. You're selling it to PG and at five cents, buying it back at 25 to 45 cents a kilowatt hour. So go do your math, folks. Don't, let, don't pay attention here. Don't, if you don't trust us, don't trust us. Go do your math and then find out what's happening under the new proposal by CPUC. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that. A couple of other comments. Inga Schlegel, it's horrible what they do to solar producers. What's the cut the state gets in this scam? Is there, is there a cut above the table? Sideways, I, I'm, I this is really pissing me off. Yeah, I can't comment on that, but it is it is outrageous, and we are we are we need everybody to email Governor Gavin Newsom, the California Public Utility Commission. On site netting must go. That's the bottom line. Um, you know they have to vote no on on site netting. I, I am confident. Once Governor Newsom finds out what's really taking place. He's not going to let this happen because this will kill the future of solar in California unless batteries become really cheap and can last a long time and you don't need any other facility. You can just stay off the grid. I'm pretty sure Governor Newsom, and I, for that really, for that matter, most members of the legislature, once they find out the damage it's going to do to the future of solar, solar production, middle class in California, then they're not going to let that happen. So let's, folks, let's uh, send this out. Uh, let's put that image back up uh, because we're almost out of time. So Gavin Newsom, if anybody wants to contact uh, him or his office, you can do it at gov.ca.gov forward slash contact. So you can go there and write an email into them, or you can go to the cpuc.ca.gov uh, and okay. you can make, make comments and send an email. On-site netting is what we're, what we're really trying to remove from the proposed decision. Well, what is the decision going to come down, Travis? They're going to vote on September 21st. Ooh. The, C the CPUC votes on September 21st. And if passed, we'll have a 90-day runway or 90-day tail until it's enforced to December 20th. Um, uh, Paul and Chad, let's, uh, September 21st, that's a Thursday. Let's, uh, we're going to um, do a countdown starting tomorrow. CPUC decision is on September 21st. You want to have the phone number to be able to call in, email, uh, all, all ways to, of contacting members of the CPUC. Yeah. So if everybody knows how to get a hold of them.
and know that the deadline, this is, honestly, this is why we put GVYR together. So as the sausage is getting <laughs> produced, folks, see it, smell it, smell some of the crap, and can go do something about it before it comes out on the other end. Um, okay, any other final comments from, uh, from Travis? Or actually, I'm going to bring Jeff in <laughs> on, on this conversation too, but Travis, any other comments? And by the way, after Jeff is done, then we'll do one minute closing comments on whatever topic you want to talk about. But anything else, Travis? No, I don't think so. I think it's just a call to action for, for anybody in the state who, who believes in solar, believes, believes in renewable energy, um, and believes in our goals as a state to get to where we're trying to get to. This is just counteract, you know, counterproductive to that. It, it, it doesn't make any sense to have these goals and then come back and regulate solar like this and put these restrictions on. So anybody that can that can take an email, take five minutes, make a call to the to the governor's office or the CPUC. Um, I encourage you to do that. And and yeah, I think that's it. Darius, appreciate the time. Hold on, don't go yet. Uh, Cam just put up something. AB two hundred five. Are you familiar with a? Uh, I should be. I don't have it in front of me. AB twenty one forty three. Oh. 205, hold on, Paul says I do, slide 20, and, oh, Assembly Bill 205 was signed, there we go, on, on the screen, thank you for that, Paul, um, there it is, this, this is where you pay income-based utility rate. Nothing like a little wealth distribution for you, Darius. That's what that is. <laughs> yeah, let's bring the gents back on. <laughs> Who said that, Travis or Jeff? Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, there you go. But I mean, California is about wealth redistribution. But yeah, I, I mean, it is. And if you, if, I think the little bit of research I did, I think Travis can check me on this. Uh, if this passes, your overall rate increases for, this, for just this year are going to be close to 32%. Uh, when you calculate everything that they've done, PG&E at, at least has done. So I'm paying right. attention. Yeah, I'm paying attention, Travis. This is good stuff, man. You got me fired up just like Darius there. Uh, Jeff, any chance we can get a, a, a documentary out before the 21st? <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I don't know about a documentary, but um, I, you know what? We'll 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 do our part to 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 make sure our viewers understand this. That's a service of what our station should be doing, just like your GV Wire does. I don't want to use uh, bad language on the air, but uh, and not, not tapped out, but uh, it starts with an F or S. <laughs> I like it. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yes, I remember, Cam. AB205, we just put it on the screen. Thank you for that reminder, Cam Malloy. Okay. Um, anything else on this, Jeff, that you want to add from your perspective as CEO of Valley PBS? I think it, what you've just, I think what you've demonstrated here, and I think you're doing a great service with GV Wire here in this in this in this Thank program you. tonight, is having people like Travis on who are out there adver advocating for, you know, not even just what's fair. I mean, I, to be honest with you, I think if the CPUC passes this, I think it's going to get challenged in court, possibly all the way to the Supreme Court. I think this is completely illegal. To, to force someone to put a solar system on their home, produce energy that they steal from you, and then you buy back. It's kind of like the old days when you went to work before labor unions came to be, and you worked for the, the iron mill, and they made you buy all your food on credit through the grocery store that they owned, and then they deducted it from your paycheck at the end of the month. And so you were bare, so they kept you starving, so they kept you working, you know, and that's kind of what we're doing on a, in a different situation here. There is actually a local okay. example of that, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But a couple of comments. Don uh, Kerr Irving, so much for caring about the environment, which, which is what I thought I was doing when I got solar. Now right. you're going to pay a, a lot more, unfortunately, um, a lot more money. A lot of great comments uh, about both of you gents for some uh, from great information. And Cam says it's uh, illegal and probably unconstitutional to do... Honestly, it should be illegal and unconstitutional, uh, what, what CPUC is trying, uh, trying to accomplish. In Fresno, city of Fresno cut it, negotiated a deal with the uh, FID 2016, one of the last months of the Swearingen administration. 
to get water, unlimited water for the surface treatment facilities, which is a good thing, right? But we gave up areas on the perimeter of Fresno that had access to water. That water went back to FID. So it was a deal that was made. Uh, one of the folks that, that is no longer at the city of Fresno told me about this a few years ago. I said, hey, listen, because of this deal, a lot of development is not going to occur in the city of Fresno because it's going to be simply too expensive to deliver water. An area that had land, water was given up. Uh, Jeff, this is something that you may want to actually check into. And I can I will. I, I will. Uh, Darius, we've done, we've done a lot of stuff on In fact, we did a whole episode on the history of FID and uh, explaining to folks you know, the history of the Kings River and that water source and how it all works and how it all came to be. It, the Fresno Irrigation District is a fascinating irrigation district in, in that it serves municipal and agriculture in such a large area. And, I, and I think I'll, I'll take the challenge from you on that and look into that more. That would be good uh, because, I mean, parts of it is good because now as a result of that agreement, we have water available 24-7 from what I understand, to both surface water treatment facilities, one in southeast Fresno, one in northeast. But we gave up some of our water uh, to FID. So you had the, this property had water. Uh, and water went to FID. When it goes to development, when it comes out of ag, goes to development, the water goes to FID. So you can't actually develop it anymore. You've got to go find a water source. And I, I, we'll, we'll talk more offline. Um, yeah, I'll jump into that one with you for sure. Perfect. Uh, Don Irving, another uh, n um, message. Now I have to buy battery storage to take advantage of the solar I produce. Well, that good news is batteries. No, batteries still leak, right? I mean, we're going to talk um, about EVs. Batteries don't leak. I mean, if, if after 10 years, well, how long does this battery last? Let's talk about that, Travis. So they're warranted for on average about 10 years and you know you can get 10 to 15 years out of the battery is it true that like a, a cars I, you see stuff on facebook from time to time electric vehicles battery replacement is between 10 and twenty thousand bucks i am not a uh, ev expert so i can't comment well, we're, on that, uh, darius but... we're at, i'm someone who has owned an ev and then gave it back lemon lauded in the california lemon law because it did not work and the battery failed in it and nobody in California knew how to fix the battery. And so I didn't have a car for three or four months. Wow. Um, and so we, and I'm not going to name the manufacturer where I bought it, but, um, uh, you know, home battery, batteries for your home, that is the future. That is the way to do this. I agree with that, by the and, way. And there, are, yes. there are companies out there, Hodges Electric, for instance, in Fresno, they are positioning themselves to uh, serve the Fresno market with battery storage systems. Uh, that are fantastic. I've looked at these systems. We're actually going to put one on in our house here. I mean, you know, and the and the and the 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 line is: Would you rather invest in PG&E's infrastructure or your own? <laughs> That's what it gets down to, right? You said it. And as a homeowner, I can encourage anybody who owns a home still look into solar. Solar still makes sense. Solar and batteries still make sense. Um, the big change that we're fighting now is virtual net metering for renters, commercial developers, commercial property owners uh, for multimeter tenants. Uh, if you're a homeowner, solar and batteries still make sense. They're very safe. Um, they absolutely pencil out. And uh, yeah, it, it's a good investment. Don, um, but I wrote it, another really good point. Hey, guys, I can't afford that. I'm paying Sunrun for the rest of my life. I don't have many years left in my life. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a tough one. Have, I mean, if you're running, if the clock's running low, then, you know, you, you take that bucket list and you change the B to an F. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cam Malloy, great show, gentlemen. I will add a battery to my system when they become more cost effective, but I'm happy right now with NEM2. But after 20, after AB205, I'm going to be stinking mad. Uh, you, uh, yes. Uh, uh, a lot of us. And yeah, we should probably do an update uh, uh, on that show uh, coming up soon. Any final thoughts, gents? Well, I just want to thank you for having me on. And I want people to, I want to, I want to invite people who maybe think that Valley PBS is your grandma's TV station to give us a shot. I hope 
my time here today has maybe inspired a little bit of investigation on your part. Come over to valleypbs.org. Watch us on Channel 18 here in the Fresno market. Look us up on, on the PBS app. We've got a lot of great things going on. A lot of great local production. That's won five Emmy Awards in the last two years, by the way. Uh, and so we're we're really proud of what we're doing here. And I appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about it tonight, Darius. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us. And I want to uh, invite you to, to come on this show frequently, update our viewers on all the programming you're working on, and, and maybe give us a teaser or a preview of what's coming up. Uh, would love to. Would, would love would, to. I appreciate it. It's fun. It's a, it's a good time talking with you, for sure. Likewise. Uh, maybe we can plan, plan this uh, monthly or quarterly or however uh, it works right. out. You know what? i got to read this comment because this is really funny. Uh, Inga <laughs> just put up, hey, just wait. If you get a battery, they will come after your stored power next. And that's what they're trying to do with uh, on-site netting, right? Or, or by by voting, you know, against it, removing on-site netting. That's exactly what they're trying. To do. Yeah, a lot of great comments. I love Valley PBS and all you do. That's from Cam Malloy. Great show, Don Irving. A uh, lot of lot of lot of great comments for both of you, gentlemen, uh, for doing a great job. Last comments from uh, Travis. Final there comments. Thanks so much. If anybody's in the state of California or looking into solar, uh, Citadel Roofing and Solar can help out. Um, we uh, partner with builders, developers, commercial, uh, residential, uh, as well as single family homes for existing homes. Um, happy to help you navigate the waters of this sometimes complicated California public utilities uh, world. And, uh, you know, we do all the heavy work and we can <coughs> partner with you on that. Um, yeah, we're here to support. Darius, thanks so much for having me. Don't go yet. And, and I'm, I'm a testimony to Citadel uh, because Granville Homes uses Citadel proudly. They're a great contractor, exceptionally reliable, great people, honest, trustworthy. And I want to put a nice plug in uh, for Citadel Roofing on all the years and years of, I mean, I, I, I want to say it goes back under a different name over a decade that we've been working together. So great relationship with you guys. You know, somebody else just put up a comment on, I think it was John Porter. And I want to, you know, I've all, I don't have an EV and I've looked at, into them. I want range, I want reliability, but one of the challenges of EVs for me is the weight. I have to have special tires and, be, and we know the heavier the car or the truck, the more damage it does on the roads. Uh, I have a F-150 uh, small block turbo diesel. The, EV version of the Ford F-150 weighs 1,500 pounds more. That's how much more weight you're carrying on the roads every day. So until we get better technology, whether it's hydrogen, the solid state battery that the Toyota and some of the other folks are developing, where from what I understand, you're gonna get close to a thousand mile range uh, on a much lighter weight and smaller battery pack. Uh, when that happens, I'm gonna definitely be into the, looking into EVs. I'm hoping that that's just around the corner a year or two away, or, or maybe it's, uh, it's gonna be hydrogen. Um, link for your company. Somebody's looking for, um, let's put Citadel, it's citadel.com. Correct, it's, yeah. Right? Citadel, C-I-T-A-D-E-L. Let's put, if we can get that, we'll put that back on. Um, it's actually not citadel.com, hang on. No, it's, hold on, we just. Citadel RS. Oh, there you go. We roofing, got it on, on the screen. CitadelRS.com. Uh, great folks. They're all over California, by the way. Uh, and do, do great work, great team. And uh, honestly, focus, cust customer service. Focus. For me, uh, and I want to say this, I remind myself and my team at Granville, and I know I'm getting off the topic. We sell trust. That's what we do. People buy a home from us, but they're really trusting us to do a nice job taking care of the issues that come up. Because mistakes happen. We're all human, uh, imperfect process, imperfect products. Uh, but they trust us to come back and honor our commitment and try to do you know, the best we can. So, and, and, and every year, I have to, every year, I have to apologize to roughly 8% of our homeowners that we just can't make happy. But we trust Citadel. And uh, very proud of our association with them. Um, what else? I think that's all we had, folks. Any, anything else? You, uh, did I cut you off, Travis? No, no, no. no. All right. Thanks, Darius. Jeff, thank you for joining us. 
Travis, thank you for joining us. And to our awesome audience, thank you for this uh, exciting and heated debate tonight. Uh, we'll have a lot more stuff uh, on, on, actually next week, uh, another very exciting topic on education in California and how do we get parents involved and a lot more uh, on, on that front. We're, we're here from a, somebody that's been involved in politics and, uh, and getting very act active in, in some of the other arenas uh, coming up soon, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I'm, as you can tell, I'm disappointed in CPUC, but no, I sh I I'm not going to say that yet. I'm hoping and I'm inspiring our members of the California Public Utilities Commission to do the right thing on the 21st and vote this thing down, help renewable energy have a fighting chance in California until technology, you know, uh, catches up. And on water, we just need to store it. Above, below ground becomes substantially easier, less controversial. Above ground, the advantage is it creates so many recreational opportunities. I mean, look at the lifestyle of folks in, in the Fresno, Clovis area, Madera area, if we didn't have some of the dams. Um, and don't forget, and Darius, don't forget, you gotta have surface storage to pay the water out to the ground storage facilities. There you go. The two work together. And we can get hydroelectric out of that. So if, if the state, some of the folks that are just, just have their tentacles on the growth and the vibrancy of our state out, we could uh, build dams, store water above ground, below ground, use it for uh, hydroelectric, clean, renewable energy source, feed the country, feed the valley, uh, uh, employ folks, generate wealth for folks, whether it's minimum wage all the way up. Um, I'm hoping, well, I, I, sh I shouldn't say I'm hoping because, what was that well, proposition? It sounds like you got it all figured out, Darius. No, what, <laughs> what was that proposition? Uh, was it Prop 1, several billion dollars for dams, and then we, they, we found out that you, none of that money could be used for above ground storage? Well, it was sold to the public as above, above ground storage money. And, and, and in 2014, it passed overwhelmingly. And then the, the great shell game happened, the bait and switch happened. And none of that money to date has been used to build a major dam project. $7 billion. That is such a shame. That, I'm, I'm so disappointed in our state. They sold it to us as this. Right. Is that called, what we call a bait and switch? <laughs> and they, you can't do any storage with that money that we all passed. What did they do with the money? Did they go to any utilities? I'm, I'm, I'm about to get off. <laughs> or maybe utility production. Did they produce, did they take that money? On, can that, Jeff, question for you, seriously. Can that money be used for electric generation? The money from Prop 1? Yeah. I, well, I'm not an expert on it, but my understanding was that it was for water infrastructure. Okay. So, so I specifically, I, you know, I think a lot of that money, if you go back and look at it, it's all public record, but a lot of that oh. money went to studies on Governor Brown's Twin Tunnels uh, program, which was to take water under the San Joaquin or the, the, San Joaquin, the Sacramento River Delta. Um, some of that money was to go to raising the level of dams like Shasta Dam. If you raise the level of the dam, you, relate, you raise the, the capacity of the water. Some of those things have happened, but you know, Temperance Flat Dam, for instance, a uh, $3 billion project um, in total with a, with a billion from the state, a billion from the federal government and a billion from private industry or water users like the LA Metropolitan Water District who would benefit from it and farming irrigation districts. Um, the state only ponied up 110 million of the billion we were asking for. Uh, Christy Dino just put up a couple of great comments. Okay, uh, that's who you need to have on your show, by the way. We've, you need I've to have asked Christy her. Diener. I've oh. asked her to get on the show, and so far she's, she's refused. Maybe she's, if she's I'll listening talk to her. now, I'll talk to her for you. Please talk to her for me. She's prop one, the whatever several billion dollar uh, uh, initiative that passed is now paying to bring down four uh, dams, Klamath dams, at a cost of two hundred and fifty million dollars. So they're using that water to tear down the dam. Tear down the dams, yeah. And so. also pay to fix Pajaro levees. Christy Diener, I know you're listening. You need to come on and sit with Darius, man. You need there to. There you go. Christy, you heard it. Uh, okay. Thank you all. Thank you for our audience uh, joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, Jeff and Travis, for a great uh, conversation and debate on two really important 
issues in California, water and power. Uh, and by the way, uh, both of those kind of work on, well, at least the water part on, on farming, sequestering and making our environment better as well. Every day. Um, on behalf of all of us at GV100, thank you all for watching. Uh, have a great week, and uh, I hope to see you all next Tuesday. We are going to have both of these gentlemen back out with us soon. Uh, and until then, have a safe and wonderful week. Take care. Thank you.